Okay. There you are. <laughs> okay. So um, let me do my share my screen. Um, here we have the um, the slides for today. And um, before we get into the um, material for the day. I want to let you know that um, I posted an announcement that you should pay attention to. Uh, the next quiz is not going to be next Monday, but next Wednesday, a week from today. So, okay. so I'll send an email out explaining that and it, the change has been made on the syllabus, but it's just a better reading for quiz material. Uh, so thanks for your patience with that. Okay, I'm really excited about this lecture. And uh, let's just go ahead and practice. I want at least a couple of people to interrupt me mid-sentence to ask a question. We're doing this live, let's take advantage of it. Who has a question? Mm, nothing just practice yet. being rude. <laughs> oh, you know, I, forget, I forgot how I was gonna open this lecture. Are you guys ready? Yeah. Okay. So I was going to say, good afternoon, cats and kittens. Isn't that it, kittens and cats? <laughs> um, I'm sure like several of you, you have been partaking in the phenomenon and train wreck that is um, the Tiger King. Has anybody seen that? <laughs> was the first episode. You've seen the first episode and you were able to stop after the first episode? That's impressive. <laughs> used i will not watch it i'm not giving in okay so why are you refusing because so many people have made so many memes about it it's just like i don't know i feel like everybody's making it so much of a bigger of a deal and we shouldn't be paying attention to stuff that's like i don't know i don't even know anything about it i've seen like a commercial and i was like i can't because i also know myself and i probably will get too into it so. Well, there's unlike Game of Thrones, which I started late and been watched, uh, binge watched, having the flu one um, one Christmas. There's only a couple of hours, and I'm not saying that you should watch it, but I do think that um, that documentary series, that documentary series, for me, um, brings up a lot of the issues that we're talking about in this lecture. Huh. Um, and so I'm trying to make a connection here. I mean, for me, one of the things that was really striking, mean, there were several striking things about that, that documentary, but just um, it really illustrates how humans and nature have become inseparable and the lack of sustainability um, that the earth faces in terms of actually providing habitat for these animals. There's more... One of the things that's covered in this in this film, in this documentary film, is that basically it's tiger breeding for cub petting. And um, people make a lot of money off of that. So much so that there are now more tigers that are held in captivity, big cats in captivity, than there are in the wild, right? Um, and basically, this is what, what this doc, what this really important article, The Trouble with Wilderness is trying to do, folks, is um, in a lot of words and in very academic texts, what Bill Cronin is trying to get us to do is to realize that if we want to save nature, we need to not be thinking about the creation of national parks or what he calls peopleless wildernesses, right? But we have to rethink our relationship to nature in our everyday lives, in the city, in our daily practices, in the way that we use materials, the waste we produce, the water we consume, right? So one of uh, the question that you're going to get on the exam is, what is the trouble with wilderness, according to Bill Cronin? And I'm going to lay it out for you really clearly here. One, he says the trouble, and by, by wilderness, what he's getting at is a, definition, is a definition of nature that excludes people. And it's true. You know, if you were to, um, I, th I think, Dan, your dog is agreeing. The dog is chiming in, Dan. Yeah. He, he agrees. He's <laughs> like, that's right. That's right. Um, so what, uh, what he's trying to get us to do, Bill Cronin, is that he wants us to think about how we define nature today. 
and that we always, and, and most people, if you ask them, what is nature? They're not gonna point to the fruit tree here on campus. They're going to point to Glacier National Park, Yosemite National Park. People have this idea that nature exists where people do not. So he's critiquing a definition of nature defined as people as wilderness. And he says there's, there's lots of problems with defining nature as people as wilderness. One, and he's writing about environmental history in the United States. And a lot of people have written about this. There's a lot of great material. I'm here in my office because there was no way in heck my children were gonna let me tape two lectures today and I had to get um, exams anyway. But I have, there's a lot of literature looking at this history. So if you're interested in this, I can provide you some more resources. Um, but what he's saying is that in the United States, the construction of wilderness areas, meaning the national park system by and large, required a lot of violence and the dispossession of Native Americans of their lands. So we'll come back to that. That's critique number one. Critique number two, he says the trouble with defining nature as peopleless wilderness is that it creates a binary between nature and society so that we understand that nature exists where society does not. And of course, we want to think relationally in this class rather than in terms of black and white opposites. We're arguing that nature and society can never be separated, that ecological processes are always social processes and vice versa. That's what geographers do, right? <laughs> and think about it. I'm getting ahead of myself here, but I'm on a, I'm getting, you know, I'm, I'm all worked up. I haven't had an audience in a while. The thing about it, you know, is that think about the construction of the university. We have the College of Liberal Arts, which is social sciences, and then we have the College of, College of Science and Engineering. Literally, our university reproduces this false binary between society and the study of society over here, biology and the study of nature over here. One science, one tries to be science, right? But what geographers do is that we insist on blending and combining both environmental inquiry with social inquiry, okay? So Cronin is a geographer at heart. He's saying we can't think about nature and society as opposite. And he says it is particularly bad for conservation to be thinking about nature as peopleless wilderness because then people like me, you know I have my new forerunner and I love it, people like me don't think about um, their daily use of resources and redefining their relationship to nature to achieve more sustainability. Okay, so that's sort of where we're going. Um, but let's go ahead, any questions so far? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I've just been telling you that geographers um, do this type of work, combining natural and physical analyses, right? Um, there is a sub-discipline of geography that's called environmental geography. And very similar to environmental geography is the field of political ecology. Has anybody heard of political ecology? It's like, you know, GI science and geography or feminist geography. Political ecology is a branch of geography, a sub-discipline of geography. And it's a critical approach to geography because by critical, we mean that we're focusing on power relations and um, thinking about uh, inequalities in relationship to the relationship between nature and society. So here's our definition of political ecology. It's an analysis of the political and economic, the political, economic, and cultural dynamics and power relations shaping nature-society relations. It's a confluence between ecologically rooted social science and the principles of political economy. A cross between the study of ecology, politics, and economics. This is your clearest and most straightforward definition. Political ecology is a field of study that, you know, imagine that you have a Venn diagram. Political economists study the overlap between politics and the economy. 
Political ecologists understand the overlap and analyze the overlap between politics, economics, and environmental dynamics. Okay, so I identify as a political ecologist. Um, and that's the, the body of literature that I'm drawing on for this lecture. Although I think Bill Cronin is a historian. But anyway, we're, not, we're interested in relations, not boundaries and binaries. <laughs> All right, so is this a picture of nature? Yes. No. Yes, what is natural? Okay, what, what other people think? What is natural about this picture? Uh, the forest itself. The forest, yeah, the trees. What else makes this uh, appear natural? The soil. The soil, exactly. Who would, so are other people who would argue that this is not nature? It's both. I mean, there's some man-made part of it. But. Nature than like, just like going out and going on a hike that's more developed, like, because it has a path and everything like that. So I think that kind of changes a little bit, having like a groomed path like that. But then again, like the pathway, it's made out of wood, so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're sort of um, speaking to this understanding of nature that's dominant in U.S. society, right? That nature is sort of someplace away from society. It's shrouded in forests. And, but clearly, this picture also illustrates that there is a lot of human impact on this environment, right? Despite the fact that it appears natural. Um, so... The way that we think about nature, and again, I really need you to understand this point that Bill Cronin is saying, he's critiquing the definition of nature as a peopleless wilderness, okay? He's wanting us to redefine how we think about nature in relationship to society rather than in opposition to society. And he says, uh, he and other folks, like this really famous guy named Raymond Williams, he, um, oops, Okay, so Raymond Williams is another sort of big figure in this body of literature. You don't need to rem remember his name, but I need to cite him because he is the one who, who basically said, you know, hey, the way that we think about nature today is not the way that society has always thought about nature. The concept of nature is historical. And one of the great quotes from his text, key words, nature, is the idea of nature contains, though often unnoticed, an extraordinary amount of history. And he works through in his text that you did not read, I did not assign it, I'm summarizing it here for you, that, um, you know, and he's focusing specifically on European uh, and Western definitions of nature, okay? Because this idea of sort of nature is the opposite of society is not how Native American tribes or many communities around the world think about nature and society, right? He's sort of thinking about the history of nature, how people have thought about nature um, in, in European societies. Okay. Um, let me just see here. Okay. We're good. All right. So... What Raymond Williams does is he says, okay, think about medieval times, right? And medieval times, we might, when is, when is the medieval era? Who knows? 14th century? Yeah, 14th century. I would say for our purposes, we can sort of think about the medieval era as preceding the sort of scientific revolution and the enlightenment okay the enlightenment begins in the 1600s right the scientific revolution the scientific enlightenment hello linnaeus 1735 right what linnaeus was doing okay let me let me take a step back okay so medieval times we're going to say up to the 1600s okay prior to the scientific enlightenment um nature was seen as the hand of god Nature was a religious force. Nature was not secular. Nature was not governed by scientific principles. Um, nature was um, God's handmaiden. So a tornado or a flood was seen as God's fate, right? And then 
about, um, we can say, let me see if I can do this. 1600s, yay, is this cool? My whiteboard. Yeah. <laughs> My, uh, so about starting in the 1600s, we have the birth of the scientific enlightenment, the secular enlightenment, and God is taken out of nature. And in its place, people like Linnaeus, and we're gonna be talking about Thomas Malthus, another key figure in this era next week, they, they strive to find scientific laws like the varieties of men, systems of classification based on so-called science rather than religion. And it's in this moment of the secular scientific enlightenment that nature um, is seen as separate from God, right? And therefore nature could be harnessed to uh, the benefit of human beings. And nature is seen as a resource rather than as a mystic force. So let me see here. Oh, come on. <laughs> this is horrible. Okay, so clear, clear all my drawings, go away. I want you to go away. Why aren't you letting me? There we go, okay. Um, okay, so um, during, you know, sort of be thinking about Linnaeus in this, in this moment, right? Man and God are separated from nature. Nature becomes um, something that can be seen as a place for human intervention, for improvement, for progress. And then we have the birth of capitalism and the Industrial Revolution. Okay, the Industrial Revolution starts a little bit later, 1750s, late 1700s, okay? And um, by the time that the Industrial Revolution comes along, people are flocking to cities. We're gonna be talking about this next week. It's a complete, the birth of capitalism is a complete transformation of human society relations. Could somebody tell me why you think, um, the transition from transition from mercantilism or feudalism to capitalism. How did that change nature society relations? And what I does think it, it kind of just made nature become more expendable because it had all the resources? And we also see that in the way that the society treats its people as well. Yes, Lily's word is not mine. So, and we're going to be talking about this next week. The creation of capitalism which has its origin in the United uh, Kingdom, and we're gonna be focusing on that history. Um, basically, it entails uh, urbanization, as people are no longer working primarily as serfs or agricultural producers on the lands of the lords and the aristocracy. Basically, the transition to capitalism means the growth in manufacturing, means people coming into the city. It means that the average man and women are no longer spending all of their working hours toiling the land, relating to the land. And now the work is taking place in the city. And so this is a further separation of labor from the landscape. And guess what? The birth of capitalism in the United States and in the UK was a dirty, nasty process. Cities were horrible. What was, what was life like in cities in the late 1800s uh, around the world. New York, London, what was it like? Pretty bad, pretty disgusting. Do you all see, um, what was the Leo DiCaprio movie about the gangs of New York? It's kind of set in that period, but yeah, what do you mean disgusting? Um, the streets were very dirty. The streets were dirty. How, what, with there was what? Like feces in the streets, feces. Feces in the street. There was no waste yeah. management. People, you know, there was dirty waters, gray waters being thrown out into the street. And, yeah. uh, right. and there was crowding. There was a lot of disease that was brought about by that proximity. So at this very moment when cities are being born <laughs> through the Industrial Revolution are growing, and people are no longer primarily working the land, but they're working the factory. Um, nature and people are, are struggling in the cities, right? And this is before the labor rights movement, people, children, we're gonna be hearing about what was like, life was like in England um, in the late 1700s, 1800s. It was 
bad. It was difficult for the majority of people. And, and even the bourgeoisie, the landed aristocracy start to romanticize nature and, and spaces outside of the city as like an escape from the noxious fumes, right? All that coal is being burned. Um, people are pissing in the streets. People are sleeping in the streets. Like the cities are just nasty. And people start to romanticize non-city spaces, rural spaces as an escape from the hardship, disease, et cetera, of the city. Does that make sense? So he's saying is that what, what William says, at the peak of development of applied science, which he's saying the scientific revolution, right? Of man's intervention into nature, the industrial revolution, start privatizing property in mass, harnessing those resources, extracting resources for manufacturing. The meaning of wilderness emerges, an unspoiled nature. So what he's saying here is that in excavating this history of nature, we see that the creation of nature defined as peopleless wilderness emerges alongside the birth of capitalism and the Industrial Revolution. Think about non-capitalist societies like the Maya that I work with or Native American tribes in the United States prior to colonization, right? There was no separation between nature and society. They were one. And so what he's saying is that in, in European and Western societies, this concept um, is produced historically at this moment. All right. Oh my gosh, there's so many. I know that that first half of that article, I didn't ask you to read it by William Cronin. He's going on about poetry and Thoreau and oh, it's just like long and tedious. I get it. But at the end of this article that I did have you read, after he lays out his argument, we get to what, you know, what I laid out at the beginning of this, of this lecture. But let's walk through some of the bigger arguments that he makes. Um, he says, Bill, Will Cronin says, um, there is nothing natural about the concept of wilderness. It's entirely a creation of the culture that holds it so dear, a product of the very history it seeks to deny. Oh my gosh, if I could write like that. Beautiful. He says, um, he says that there's nothing natural about the concept of wilderness. He's saying is that wilderness spaces were historically produced, right? And, and um, the creation of wilderness erases the very history that produced it. Because if you define a wilderness space as a space outside of society, well, then you're assuming there's no social history in that space. We need to rethink that. Okay. So um, Cronin is telling us about sort of how nature was defined in the United States. And there's you know, some overlap with these different periods, but again, we're trying to make the argument that nature as peopleless wilderness is a very recent concept that relates to the birth of and expansion of capitalism. He says in, uh, in the late 1700s, right, this is still the sort of transition into the scientific moment, you know, all of these changes are unfolding. Wilderness is seen as, as waste, deserted, savage, desolate, barren. And this is you know, full of bewilderment and terror. And this certainly would um, also be the concept of wilderness that predominates medieval types as well, okay? But he says, with the birth of capitalism and at the end of the 18th century in the United States, here he's talking about the United States, not, not Europe. Um, Bill Cronin says things change, and he identifies two main dynamics. Okay, so these, this is going to get a little heady, but let me walk you through it. Okay, so he says in the late 1800s in the United States, so the, capital, the Industrial Revolution is well underway. The revolution is like from 1750 to 1850, so this is during still those 100 years of transition. Um, and this is what's happening in the United States. By the end of this transition, what has happened? He says that, well, first of all, there's this intellectual movement called Romanticism. And um, this moment of Romanticism is, it's like an intellectual movement, kind of like neoliberalism. We've talked a little bit about that or, or you know, economic national. It was this idea that um, John Muir was really behind. And basically what happens with this movement of romanticism is, I think I've got a picture here I wanna show, 
is that um, the romantics, they basically say that God can be found in nature once again. They sort of reinsert a notion of the sublime or religious experience into nature, okay? This is a famous image. Has anybody ever seen this painting before? Mm. This painting is called, oopsie. Oh, I didn't want to Wander above the sea fog. Yes, can you see it? Yeah, wander above the sea fog. Can you all see my uh, PowerPoint still? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, this is a really famous painting. I was teaching this lecture like two years ago here at Texas State and this poster was larger than life. Some orchestra had been using it. And I was like, there it is. Um, but it's this idea that nature, the wilderness is actually God's cathedral. And, it, you know, and some of us feel that way. I certainly do when I go into nature defined as wilderness. Sometimes when I'm out and about in nature, I feel a sense of the sublime. I feel a religious connection or a connection to a higher power. So when that sort of idea um, really comes from this movement of romanticism. And this was, this was a reinserting of God into nature, right? The other component um, that Cronin says happens at this time is the, the closing of the American frontier. Okay, so here's your, here's your quiz from the past. When was the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo? 18. Oh boy. And did the Mexican-American War? 18. 1848, right? So you're right in this moment after the Mexican-American War, manifest destiny, westward expansion. What's happening in America is that the frontier is closing. The West has been won. The West has been conquered. And there was this concern that the frontier, that sort of frontier experience, um, needed to be preserved. <laughs> And it actually had a lot to do, let me see if I, okay, there we are. And what's interesting about this sort of closing of the frontier is that um, there was sort of this American identity wrapped up. I don't need to explain this to you. We were here in Texas. My kids go to Davy Crockett Elementary School, or they did before they got transferred to the Spanish program. Um, this idea of sort of winning the West and conquering the West was about the rugged frontierism, the individualism that made Americans American. So there was like this movement born to conserve these frontier spaces because these frontier spaces is precisely what made American men American, right? Compared to their European uh, counterparts and the whole history of the cowboy, the history of manifest destiny was seen as central to American identity and American white American identity um, and, and white American culture. And there was sort of this idea that, you know, this, this was wrapped up with American notions, white American notions of masculinity and upper class notions of masculinity that um, city, life had, city life had feminized uh, the men. And not only were cities dirty, but uh, you know, a, a place where a man could go be a man was the rugged, the rugged West. And um, let me just sort of mute you all. Somebody's having some lunch. Okay, so you can um, unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. I would encourage you to do so, but I don't have my headphones. I'm concerned about the quality of the video, so I'm just going to mute it. So um, Cronin says, country people, you know, he's saying, he's sort of poking at the class dynamics here. He says, country people generally know far too much about working the land to regard unworked land as their ideal. In contrast, elite urban tourists and wealthy sportsmen projected their le leisure time frontier fantasies onto the American landscape and so created wilderness in their own image. And um, there's a lot of other resources. I wish I had thought about this before. I put my finger on it, but I can give it to you later. Where's, I have a whole political ecology section here in my library um, where we talk about these histories Okay, here are two books in particular. This one, I actually wrote a book review for. This is The Rise of the American Conservation Movement, 
This is the same history that you're getting here about what was happening in cities, how wealthy white upper class people felt that cities were disgusting and wanted to escape them. And, and, and then this is another great book that talks about African Americans' relationships to um, national parks. Would you be surprised to learn that national parks were segregated based on Jim Crow legislation? So that whole idea that African Americans don't enjoy the great outdoors as much as white folks, uh, one is sort of a myth. Number two um, is also reflecting sort of the violence and the history of national parks in our society. Hit me up for some of that if you want more details. Okay, um, so what did this combination of romanticizing nature and a fear of the frontier closing, how did that come together? That is what galvanized the creation of the national park system in the United States, okay? So Yosemite was deeded by the US government to the state of California in 1864, the nation's first wild land park. Yellowstone becomes the first true national park in 1872. And here folks, this is number, the first of three sort of points I want you to remember about the trouble with wilderness is that the creation of pristine wilderness required the erasure of Native Americans from the landscape at the tail end of the Indian Wars. Now, for those of you who um, watched the lecture, participated in the lecture on the paper, I was talking to you about the treaty in Washington State that removed the Yakima from the town that's now called Yakima and put them several um, hundred miles away in a reservation and forced them to remain on the reservation. The creation of the reservation system, not just in Washington state, but around the country is unfolding alongside the creation of the American national park system. And for those of us who love national parks, that is a history um, that is difficult to bear. And um, if we had a lot more time, I could draw on some resources here from the rise of the American conservation movement. There's a whole chapter here that gets into how um, basically it's, it's, very, it's very similar to Linnaeus's sort of disciples going around through South America. In the United States, geographers and land surveyors accompanied the cavalry that would move through these spaces trying to round up the Native Americans or kill them and move them to a reservation. At the same time, they were establishing the boundaries of the national park system. The example that Cronin gives in his um, reading is Glacier National Park. Glacier National Park is the ancestral land of the Blackfoot uh, Native tribe. And um, to create Glacier National Park, uh, the Blackfoot uh, were violently dispossessed of, of their lands. So one of the main troubles with wilderness is that it erases the very history that produced it. By defining nature as peopleless wilderness, we are ignoring the violence and land dispossession that created the national parks that we consider to be nature. Any questions? Anybody still there? Yeah, I actually have a question. Um, so I guess uh, with the wilderness, I'm sorry, I'm trying to think of how to say this. Um, with preservation, how would that work? Is there a way to like preserve, like during this time, did they also think about not just like trying to conserve the land, but preserve it to where people can coincide with the parks or was it more just we can't touch it and if that makes sense. Yeah, I'm going to pull out another book and this is all you're setting me up beautifully for where I'm headed okay. Oh. This book here is called Fortress Conservation and this is the type of conservation model that Cronin is critiquing. This book cr critiques it too. Fortress conservation, the idea that the way that you conserve an area 
is to remove all of the people from it and treat it like a fortress. You use law, you use police forces to make sure that people are not living in that space, accessing resources in that space. So with the creation of the conservation movement, there is some, there is some tensions that we don't need to get into here, but by and large, what, you're, what you need to understand was that the conservation effort was fortress conservation. It was not about allowing indigenous people to co-manage the land or access resources on the land. There were barriers established and those barriers were enforced uh, with legal mechanisms and, and violence. Gotcha. Uh, we're gonna be getting at an alternative uh, by the end of the lecture, which is gonna bring me to my research. Any other questions? Okay, so we need to um, stop thinking in terms of, okay, so number two, second point that Cronin makes. He's saying, what is the trouble with wilderness? We need to stop thinking about wilderness as, um, we need to stop defining nature as peopleless wilderness, and we need to stop defining nature as opposed to society. Most people think about nature and culture like black and white, right? They're opposites, uh, but that is not true. We need to understand um, that nature and society are deeply interlinked, right? That our social systems are deeply interlinked with economic or ecological systems. So he says on page 17, wilderness embodies, and again, wilderness is this idea defining nature as people, this wilderness, embodies a dualistic vision in which the human is entirely outside of the natural, right? This is a problem because it forecloses more complex understandings of human and environmental interaction, as I've been saying. And this is really interesting, okay? So what? Well, Sorry, I'm gonna, I hope I'm not messing this up. Okay, pristine notions of wilderness, nature as defined as people as wilderness is actually bad for conservation. Dana, this is your point. <laughs> He's saying think about, thinking about nature and conservation in this way is counterproductive. It's actually bad for nature. He says any way of looking at nature that encourages us to believe that we are separate from nature as wilderness tends to do, is likely to reinforce environmentally irresponsible behavior, right? Because if you define, uh oh, if you define, um, you know, conservation as building national parks, but yet you're using four or six plastic water bottles and not taking your bags to the grocery store, you're living a really environmentally unsustainable life, right? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if we have five parks or seven parks, as long as 330 million Americans are throwing away plastic bags and burning fossil fuels in our daily lives the way we are, we are not going to reach sustainability on this planet. Does that make sense? Okay, I got a question. Mitchell, you said you want to um, chime in? Uh, no, ma'am. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay, so I have a question for you. Who has seen, um, and I showed it, I, I gave you a preview of where we were headed, but um, who has seen the waste management trucks around town and can tell me what um, you often see on the side of the big garbage trucks? Um, usually there's a person that it's like we'll jump out of the truck and then dump the garbage. But on the side of the truck. Oh. Um, you mean like the, like the picture of the yeah. truck? Yeah. Um, oh. There's some like animals and pictures of nature. <laughs> pictures of nature, right? Defined as people, this wilderness. I had my garbage guy came the other day and I took a picture. I want to see if I like can a, find it. Like a rhino or something, like a zebra. Yeah. Okay. So I can't find it. Here's just a couple of pictures that I got got offline. Um, and what you can see here, I think you should be able to see. This is just one of waste management's uh, trucks. It says naturally aligned with the needs of the planet. 
right? And then up here in the corner, it says, from where we sit, green, um, green something breathing reality. And some, and what's interesting is that, you know, these are trucks in Texas, but yet we have exotic African animals. What do you, what do you, do you think that this, this definition of nature um, exemplified by waste management is exactly the definition of nature that Cronin is critiquing? Um, yes, yeah. most definitely. And what's bizarre is that waste management actually has a wildlife park. Is that true? It's beautiful. It's really beautiful. And it's right up in Buda. I go there every year. I'm sure it is beautiful, but waste management controls, if somebody could look for, I think if somebody could just Google quickly, how much of the United States uh, waste in, uh, industry, the company waste management owns or manages, if somebody could find that um, by searching, that would be really helpful. And then just interrupt me when you get that data. How much of the wildlife industry? How much of the waste management industry? Oh, waste. Yeah, like how much of America's garbage? does waste management manage? I think they're like 20% or something. Okay, so um, when you get that data, but it, you know, so it's waste management is a big company. It's not just here in Texas, it's over the entire country. And the United States has 5% of the world's population, but has 25% of the world's trash. The U.S. produces 25% of the world's trash, even though the fact that we're only 5% of the world's population. So tell me why you think it's actually potentially bad for the environment that waste management is defining going green in this way. <coughs> what else could waste management do besides having exotic African animals in New Braunfels to conserve nature? Maybe teach teach people um, like not only how to recycle because a lot of people don't know like what they're supposed to recycle. So maybe have some kind of um, educational paper that can distinguish what you're supposed to recycle, and then also things that can help uh, reduce pollution. Like I don't know. Like this sounds gross, but just flushing your toilet water every day, it uses like, I think 20 gallon or 2000 gallons of water of just clean water every day, if you flush it five times a day. So okay. I had a friend in Alaska who came and saw me and she says, yellow, let it mellow, brown, flush it down. I flush all the time, but I, you know, I, uh, but yes, what you're getting at Dana is exactly the point. Could somebody else talk about how some of this money uh, or energy of waste management could be directed towards um, reducing waste or managing waste in different ways? What about, what about the cost of recycling versus throwing away trash or even composting? Uh, I know and I live in Austin. We have compost uh, bins and recycling. And I believe Austin has a contract with waste management, which was, I know, contingent at the start of the year. And I think they just kept it. Um, I guess I was also just going to mention, because I was looking at the what you were mentioning yeah. about waste management. And I haven't really found anything on, on their land control, but... Um, and they don't mention waste management directly, but it says big waste dominates every aspect of solid waste and recycling practice and policy. Top four consolidated companies earn 30 billion of the 70 billion economic sector. Right, um, right. 75% of the landfill capacity in major metro areas. Right, it's, yeah, so this is definitely big business and, and um, this, you know, the creation of waste management was really a product of neoliberalism. Uh, state governments used to own these facilities and then private companies that, that um, took over in the 1970s and the 1980s. But what's so interesting and what you're all getting at, oh, naturally aligned with the needs of the planet, right? This is the problem with wilderness. 
if you think that the largest waste management company in the United States is being naturally aligned by having zebras from Africa and New Braunfels, you're not thinking about everything they could be doing to bring that figure down from 25% of the world's trash produced by Americans. We could make, I only get recycling every other week. Um, and I don't even have composting available. We could make composting free. We could make recycling heavily subsidized versus, uh, there could be price mechanisms attached to landfill waste versus recycling versus incentivizing people through composting. Uh, there could be educational opportunities provided by waste management, as Dana was saying, to teach people about composting, to educate them about recycling, right? What a wasted opportunity, pardon the pun, to be having one of the world's largest garbage companies practicing conservation through the creation of zebra habitats in Texas. It blows my mind. It blows my mind. What else can we do in our daily life to improve our relationship to nature, apart from building national parks or wildlife preserves? Um, I have a quick question. So how do you, I think in the U.S. we have a big waste culture. How do you think that we could change that? Because we'll see when we go um, have a barbecue with friends, everything is um, plastic silverware, plastic plates. Um, when we go to the grocery store, everyone just doesn't bring their um, reusable bags and um, the grocers will put one or a few items in one plastic bag instead of stuffing as much as possible. So people leave with 20s, like 20 to 30 plastic bags. So how that's like a culture that has just been so embedded or we're so used to doing that. We'd never think about bringing a plat or bringing a reusable bag to the grocery store. We never think about um, other ways that we could lower our waste. So I think it's a big cultural thing. What do other people think? Quincy, I think you're on mute. Oh, I still can't hear you. Can anybody else hear Quincy? No. No. You might have problem with your microphone. Anybody else want to chime in while she's figuring that out? I actually was listening to a really interesting podcast on just like waste culture in America and how it was basically come up, it was basically brought up by the companies themselves. Um, I'll probably send it out in the group me, but it was like one of the most interesting things I've ever heard. And it's also like shows how Keep America Beautiful is also tied into that, where we actually, whenever you think about like Keep America Beautiful or like Texas Beautiful, like you think that like, oh, they're against the waste and everything, but literally they're a part of the problem as well because all the waste all the blame about waste gets put on us as consumers, but then we don't hold like big businesses and other practices to the same standard. It's just, it was really interesting. Yeah, I'd be interested to see that too. But I think, I can't remember who asked the question about the culture that I think that this is a cultural dynamic, right? So it is about how do you change the culture and, and for me, I'm almost, I like the idea while those messages are, are contradictory and oftentimes um, uh, hypocrite, you know, hypocrite, they're, they're hypocritic, hypocritical in the sense that those companies are the very ones who are doing the big polluting, you know, maybe there's a way that we can harness American patriotism to do right by the planet or something. Like it's a really powerful discourse, right? American patriotism and doing what's right for the country. But, um, on the other hand, you know, there are often times when the government says, even though the people don't think this is a good idea, we're going to make it illegal or um, expensive to do these things that we believe are bad for society and the environment. So if you think about like the law requiring that everyone wear safety belts um, or that you be 21 to have access to alcohol or, you know, like there's certain protections that states can put into place. So I don't know, you've got to work at changing the culture, but I also think sometimes policy can precede cultural changes. And there certainly are different cities around um, the country that have 
prohibited the use of plastic bags. And it's not a violation of your human rights to not be able to have free unlimited plastic bags, right? That's not what freedom is about. <laughs> that's not, yeah. Um, that's not a violation of your First Amendment rights if you have to bring your bags. So there might be, um, there might be ways to be pulling at culture but also um, using policy to, you know, fuel standards for cars, getting at the companies rather than always leaving it up to, to the individuals. Um, anybody else want to chime in before I go back to screen share on other options? Um, I would point out that plastic water bottle manufacturers, they use like several million gallons of oil each year and this can be used to fill to fuel like hundreds of thousands of cars and that could help out a lot yeah and that's that's an interesting example evan because um i mean especially with your age group i do see people carrying around water bottles refilling water bottles so you know, I think Cronin is asking us to get at are sort of these micro ways that we can each make changes to really think about conservation and um, sustainability outside of national parks. I'm not saying that I don't like national parks. I love national parks, but that ain't going to save the planet. Okay, right? Um, I want to take you to one of my favorite places, the Maya Biosphere Reserve, and talk to you about how this notion of peopleless wilderness, nature's peopleless wilderness, has backfired tremendously um, in terms of its conservation outcomes. So the Maya Biosphere Reserve is in Guatemala. This is the northern part of Guatemala that you see here on your screen. And you don't have to have a PhD in geography to see that there's a spatial pattern in this 8,000 square mile forest. This is a forest, it's about the size of Delaware, which is really big for Guatemala, um, but of course small for the scale of Texas, but nonetheless, this is a big chunk of land, 8,000 8, square miles. What you see on the map here in the yellow color and the orange color is the number of times that this um, land has been burned forest has been burned. And then in green, you see where forest cover remains. So um, tell me where, is there a spatial pattern to deforestation in the Maya biosphere? This is a 20 year time period. Definitely. Okay, so where, where, where's the spatial concentration of deforestation? The west of the reserve. Right. And what's so ironic about the concentration of fires in the West is that these are the two largest national parks in the Maya Biosphere Reserve. These are the peopleless wildernesses of the Maya Biosphere Reserve. Here in the eastern part of the park, that is where communities are allowed to live and sustainably harvest timber resources. These are the community foresters that I work with in Guatemala, which is um, an, an amazing development model, or rather an alternative to um, US-led economic development. This is a grassroots peasant model of development. Um, and I'm gonna have you watch a 15-minute video after we um, get off the, the lecture here that tells you a little bit more about the, the history of this environmental and social justice movement. But to make a long story short, the Maya Biosphere Reserve in Guatemala was created in 1990. And it was created by um, conservationists within Guatemala, wealthy, powerfully connected, politically powerfully connected people, and also their allies in the Wildlife Conservation Society in uh, the United Nations. There was international conservation organizations that advised Guatemala on how to create this protected area. And they brought their ideas about peopleless wilderness with them, unfortunately. And what they did, these architects of the Maya Biosphere in 1990, they put the western half of the Maya Biosphere, 4,000 square miles, 
into national parks, these areas were the most ecologically sensitive. Rams are wetlands, internationally recognized wetlands. Um, scarlet macaw breeding sites, some of the last in the country. And um, what we can see here is that this conservation model, this fortress conservation model of creating national parks where nobody's supposed to live or nobody's supposed to work have completely backfired. They are the areas that have been hit the hardest by um, deforestation. Yet where we have communities allowed to live and work and their resources are extracted sustainably and monitored by the government and the Forest Stewardship Council, we have sustainability. This is the alternative to creating peopleless wildernesses as a conservation strategy. Now, um, who knows based on my talks before or stuff I've said in class, what is driving a lot of this deforestation in these national parks? Who's behind it? Narco too. Narcos is always the right answer. Yes, Jean. <laughs> I think I recognized your voice. Why are narcos deforesting the national park? Well, they're ranching cattle. This is a phenomenon in um, Guatemala that's known as narco cattle ranching, narco ganaderia. And my research studies the environmental impacts of drug trafficking in Central America. So I study narco cattle ranching. I was working with the foresters studying alternative development. And they were telling me that narco ganaderia is the biggest threat to their conservation movement. And I was like, what the heck is narco ganaderia? That's what started me on this research path about 10 years ago, studying this phenomenon. Why are narcos ranching cattle? As an excuse to like money launder. It's about money laundering. Cattle ranching is one of the largest industries. It's uh, a way for them to, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just gonna say, um, it's a way for them to like cover up the drug trafficking. Right, like yeah. they can kind of smuggle it into the... Exactly, what you see here in this, um, in this picture here is an illegal airstrip that's been built. And you can even see like there's like a wetland a little up in the corner. These illegal airstrips are being built along the, um, let me go back up here, along the Mexican-Guatemalan um, border. It so, looks like the map of Texas. Yeah, it does. Uh, the Maya Biosphere Reserve shares 50% of Guatemala's border with Mexico. And when Calderon, you remember Calderon and when we talked about the war on drugs? When he took on the narcos in the early 2000s, remember when the PAN was elected and they started implementing U.S. war on drugs policies? Again, another balloon effect happened and the narcos started, instead of flying into Mexico, they started flying into this area here. There are over 120 illegal airstrips found in this tiny area. Just planes full of cocaine landing in these strips. And as Dana said, the cattle ranches provide somewhat of a cover. So it's about smuggling drugs, but it's also, as Jean said, also about laundering money, okay? So cattle can be bought, uh, you know, if you could spend $500,000 on, um, you know, a couple thousand head of cattle, at the end of the fattening season, you can sell that cattle and turn a small profit and your money is laundered. And it does have to do with um, a particular loophole within uh, the Central American common market. So when Central America underwent neoliberal economic reforms, remember neoliberal reforms like NAFTA, promote free trade, free trade agreements. One of these neoliberal policies in Central America was the creation of a Central American common market that would later become CAFTA. Are you all with me? Yeah. I know I'm laying down the political economy here pretty quickly, but um, there was a, there's a loophole with cattle. If you're a cattle rancher within that common market, within that free trade zone of Central America, you do not have to have a receipt 
for the purchase of your cattle or the sale of your cattle within Central America. But the minute that these cattle ranchers sell to Mexico, which is not part of the Central American Free Trade Agreement, it's part of the North American Free Trade Agreement, the laws change. You do have to provide a receipt. So what drug traffickers do, I probably shouldn't be posting this online, but I've already published it, so whatevs. Um, okay, so the, what the drug traffickers do is that they buy the cattle, they build the airstrips, they claim the territory, and then they buy the cattle in Central America, and then they sell the cattle to uh, a Mexican meat producer that's going to supply the North American market, and they get a receipt. Do you understand? So they don't have to have a receipt showing when and where they got the money to purchase the cattle in Central America. But if they sell it to Mexico or to the United States, they do get a receipt for that sale. So then if the IRS was to come to a drug trafficking organization in Guatemala and they'd be like, where'd you get that $550,000? They say, well, through the sale of cattle. Here's my receipt from the Mexican Walmart purchaser. And then the government says, well, how did you buy the cattle? Where, where's the proof of you having the, the money to buy the cattle that you sold? Well, senor, I don't have a receipt because we don't need to have one. Do you see how that loophole makes uh, cattle ranching so perfect for laundering drug money? And then of course, if all you're doing is interested in laundering money, you don't have a whole bunch of employees, you don't have to build a lot of infrastructure and cattle be expensive, right? So you can go through a lot of capital, a lot of narco capital, and launder it through cattle ranching. Does that make sense to people? So that explains why narco cattle ranching, well, it explains why narco cattle ranching is, exists, but it doesn't explain why it's concentrated in the national parks. You tell me why you think narco cattle ranching would be concentrated in the national parks rather than in the community forestry concessions. Only because it is like it's mostly like untouched land and if you actually like burn it down and make enough cattle grazing land then you're able to like have a bigger space for all your cattle pretty much there's I mean, that there's that um, and yes and, and what else would people hypothesize they're away from society they're away from what society cities and it's just like in the dark it's not like yeah, like people, it's away from society, and also, um, I was going to add, not that it's not regulated, but it's, it's kind of like left alone, like, you know, there's not many people, so you can hide yeah, things. Who's, yeah, who is supposed to enforce the law in these national parks? Government. government. The Guatemalan government. Yeah. Do you think that maybe the Guatemalan government or some, let's, let's put it a little bit more precisely, some individuals within the Guatemalan government are motivated to okay. stop this activity? And even if they were motivated, do you think the Guatemalan state is more powerful than the Mexican cartels and all of their money that are conquering this space? right? No. The Guatemalan government lacks the, the ability and oftentimes the political will to stop these activities because Guatemala, many institutions within Guatemala, individuals have been corrupted by the money and the violence of these organizations. So who is implementing the rule of law if it's not the Guatemalan state in the community forest concessions? No. It's the communities, right? Hmm. The people are becoming stewards of the land. They manage their ancestral lands. They are doing the work that the state cannot or will not do because their livelihoods depend on it. And so the answer to sort of what's working in the eastern part of the reserve is the creation of the community forest concessions. Uh, these concessions, a concession is a land grant. These concessions, these communities do not own the land. It's not private property, it's state property. But they have a 25-year contract with the Guatemalan state to exclusively um, manage resources in their concession, okay? So a concession is an area of land, like a national park, 
that, it, that the communities that live in this area, they own the natural resources and manage the natural resources, but they do not own the land. And in exchange, they fight wildfire, they monitor biodiversity, they denounce illegal activities in their areas, and there are currently nine community concessions that are operating, and they are under the umbrella of the nonprofit organization Patens Association of Forest Communities. This is the organization that works as the political umbrella of uh, the community forest concessions, the Patens Association of Forest Communities, or in Spanish, La Asociación Forestal de Comunidades de Petén, or ACOFOC, is the acronym in Spanish. These communities um, were established during uh, the 1910s, 1920s by workers from the Wrigley's Chewing Gum Company. Here's my neighbor. I lived in these communities for two years doing research during my PhD. Um, in one of the communities, this is my neighbor, and he's actually doing the old school extraction of chicle latex from the trees that are found in this area. So these communities have been here for hundreds of years, um, sustainably extracting resources. And when the Maya Biosphere Reserve was created, um, they began a 10 year political fight to create community forest concessions. Originally, the government was going to give these timber rights to private companies. And they organized, they protested, they went to the World Bank, they, they um, drew on the peace accords to justify their land rights. Um, and to make a long story short, after 10 years of protracted political struggle, in the year 2000, the community concessions uh, were established. And now, 20 years later, we have evidence that illustrates that this conservation model where native indigenous people are managing their ancestral lands in the name of conservation and economic development, it works better than this model of peopleless wilderness that was built into the Maya biosphere and the most ecologically sensitive areas were put into this strict area of conservation that has been a con complete catastrophe. I, got, I have stories of driving through Laguna del Tigre that would blow your mind. Um, but we don't have time to get into it another time. Okay. So um, we're, we're just uh, out of our time here, folks. But what I want to assign to you is for you to watch this 15 minute video about community forestry in um, that's going to tell you a lot about the, the organization that I work with. And the reason that I'm, I'm drawing so heavily on the story of community forestry in the Maya biosphere is that it does two things. One, it illustrates the trouble with wilderness is bad for conservation, <laughs> okay? Um, especially in the third world when states are too poor or too weak to implement strict conservation law, right? Communities are better and playing the role and helping govern those areas. Number two, I've been critiquing sort of IMF-led economic development. And some of you have asked me, what's the alternative? The alternative is grassroots development, or we might even call it grassroots social and environmental justice, whereby people organize themselves, define their needs, collect, create their own institutions, um, to pursue an alternative to um, uh, neoliberal or IMF-led development. So this is an example of a successful alternative model of development that we're looking at as well. Um, so let me just pause and ask what questions you have at this point before we wrap up. I threw a lot at you. You might have some questions. I'm trying to think of how to word it. Um, I guess in like the instance of these grassroots and like state owned public lands that are managed by the people wouldn't like where, where would um, 
you know, the state's interest be in a, I mean, quote, more developed country? Because really wouldn't at some point they just want to use the land for economic development and then the people would be kind of pushed to the side and yeah it's a big problem it's a big concern most definitely um mitchell was your question sort of can you restate your question sorry i guess um that works like the mile biosphere reserve works pretty well in guatemala but if you were to try to put that same system in play in the US where say Yosemite, just for example, you were allow people to live there. And obviously the consumer culture is very different, but wouldn't uh, people, it, where would be the benefit in doing that? Because right. would people um, kind of destroy it or mess with it? And, yeah, well, so one of the things that, you know, might be a more appropriate way of thinking about the, is to remember that um, the people who are managing the Maya Biosphere Reserve, they claim that land is their ancestral land. And they are, most of them identify as Maya. So rather than sort of just letting any Guatemalan citizen come into the Maya Biosphere Reserve, it is only a select group of people who have a historical record of land management in that area right and dependency on resources so what this model might look like would be rather than just sort of opening it up for anybody if you're thinking about um the grand canyon national park for example you could argue that that park be co-managed by the navajo the hopi tribes uh, alongside the government what what is happening in the community's concessions is actually co-management between the people who live there and the state so, you know, for the U.S. example, I would think about, you know, sort of the environmental and also social justice that might come out of Native American tribes co-managing national parks that are their ancestral homes. Hmm. That makes sense. But also, you know, what you're getting at here, too, is that um, there's a big difference between sort of the wealthy first world developed country scenario versus a third world country like Guatemala. Guatemala has the most unequal land tenure system in the world. 50% of the people are Maya who practice subsistence farming. There's immense poverty, immense malnutrition. Um, and so it's an agricultural based economy and a lot of not a lot the minority but still some of that deforestation in the national parks are actually peasant squatters who are farming there because they have no other place to and if you think about sort of you know um, protected areas in other third world countries whether it be in southeast asia or, or we're talking about sub-saharan africa there are also examples where you have weak poor states who depend upon these communities to co-manage these lands. Oh, and by the way, it's the right thing to do because it's their ancestral land. It's, yeah. it's not just a free for all of letting anybody come in and take resources. Gotcha. These are still conservation areas. Yeah. Good question. Thank you. Um, I need to post um, an example of the essay Sorry that I haven't done that yet. Post essay example. I promised that on Monday and I haven't done it. Um, okay, so are there any other questions? Um, I actually have a question. So people living, I forgot what you said, but if if people are living in the bi, uh, myo, myo My biosphere, biosphere. Uh -huh. um, is that, did you say that was sustainable? Yes, or actually, the, good the, the forest is more sustainable and better conserved where people are living than in the national parks where the state oh. kicked everybody out. Right. Sure. Yeah. Um, and I'm absolutely obsessed with this, um, this movement. And, you know, it's really beautiful because... Um, Community forestry in Guatemala, like shoot, you guys know a little bit about the history of Guatemala now. If you can do this in Guatemala, anybody can do this. <laughs> Maybe not anybody, 
But I want you to understand, you know, that all of this was achieved post-war during the, the war on drugs. This is like an amazing political achievement, right? Um, and so this model has now become like a model for the rest of the world. And when I was there recently, there were like delegations from Cuba or not Cuba from um, Colombia because Colombia now is going through its peace process and are thinking about creating conservation models like community forestry. And so, you know, here you have these 30,000 peasants, half of which couldn't read, you know, they have redefined conservation models. There are over 650 biospheres throughout the world. It's part of a UNESCO, a UN program, the biosphere. And um, the forest concessionaires travel the world uh, teaching people about how they created this movement and, and how they go about it. It's not perfect by any stretch of the, the imagination. But the proof is in the satellite imagery, right? Oh, and by the way, you know, this model creates uh, 20, there's, it's $20 million a year that's made off of timber and other products. And it's that money is distributed in the communities. It pays for the, the wildfire, for the firefighters. It pays for the biodiversity. It pays for the education, the health care. It provides loans for people when they get sick. Like basically, ACOFOP, the organization ACOFOP is doing the work of the Guatemalan state. Okay, so when you, you want another 15 minutes to relax before you get back to writing your paper, I do want you, um, I didn't need to download that, but here we are. I want you, um, let me see here, stop share, bear with me here. Okay, so this is the video. I'm interested to see if this video works for you. Is it working? The sound is horrible, isn't it? In the northeast of Guatemala, amongst ancient Maya okay. roots and diverse tropical rainforest, lies one of the largest community managed forests in the world. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just a little, just a little preview for you there of uh, your 11 minute video to go to Guatemala momentarily. You can't leave your house, but you can telecommute to Guatemala and go to the jungle and, and you can see some images of the villages that I had the chance to live in and work in. Um, so any other questions? We're out of time. It's 150 folks. Happy belated birthday. Why, thank you very much. Oh, 30, 33 birthday. again. Um, and uh, you can, thank you, Jean, very much. And you can, um, Find me um, in office hours tomorrow from two to three if you have any more questions about the trouble with wilderness, okay? No, it erases no. the Happy violence birthday. that created it, separates nature and society, bad for conservation. That's the trouble with wilderness, all right? No, all You're right. all wonderful. I wish that we were here in person, but I'm glad that we were able to meet up today. Take care and we will see you on forums, email, or in office hours. All right. Bye, yeah. everybody. Bye.